Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Thomas Alexander. I am a uh, quantum solutions developer at IBM Quantum. And that's kind of a, a, a pretty vague title. But for the most part, what I do is uh, a mixture of front end and back end development focused on the lower level of control that sits underneath quantum circuits or the quantum circuit model. And we call that Qiskit Pulse or Open Pulse. Uh, and, and really, this is uh, this is the interface between the the hardware and the quantum gate model, which most applications focus on. And, and today, I'm going to talk a, a bit about pulses, how that relates to timing in quantum circuits, and why you you might care about this. Uh, and so, I want to thank you for joining me uh, in, in these trying times. I hope that I can teach you a little bit. I can show you some of the cool features we've been working on in Kizkit. And I hope that uh, you know you can get to know me a little bit and, and uh, feel free to reach out uh, to me on Slack or on GitHub in the future and, and you know give me some feedback or, or even contribute new features or request new features. Uh, so before we get started, I'd just like to say that uh, I am in quarantine right now at a location with pretty poor bandwidth. So if you see me start to block out for a second, uh, maybe post in the YouTube comments and I can uh, circle back and, and try uh, to say what I was saying again. And also feel free to post questions in the YouTube comments as well. And I'll try and monitor uh, them as I go along uh, and, and maybe answer them if I can. Uh, so I, I might get a bit too in, in, in depth into my presentation and lose track, but I'll try my best. So with that, let's get started. So today I'm going to be talking about Qiskit Pulse. And, and to do that, I'm going, I'm going to be using Qiskit uh, a lot. This will be, in a sense, a live demo. I'm not going to run any experiments on, on actual hardware, uh, uh, just because I don't want to deal with some of the unpredictability that comes with the real world. But we're going to run through a demo of how, uh, uh, of how we can take our quantum circuit and look at what actually gets implemented in the hardware underneath and why that actually gets done. Uh, and, and then we'll, we'll look at how we actually take a quantum device uh, when, when we get it out of the fab and, and put it in this hardware, put it in the fridge, cool it down, connect it up to our control electronics, uh, and then we actually have to turn that that chip into a quantum computer. And we'll do that ourselves with a simulator today. Uh, so uh, to get started, uh, here's your first look on this slide uh, at, at the Pulse Builder interface in Qiskit. So this is new in Qiskit, uh, uh, Terra v, uh, in Qiskit v.20. Uh, and so here we see we've defined a, a quantum program uh, that's just a list of pulses on different channels. Uh, and in this case, it happens to spell out Qiskit. I, I think it's pretty, uh, it's a cute little demo. Uh, and so I'll, show, I'll talk a bit more about what that means uh, a couple slides down the road. But first, let's start with the circuit model. So uh, before we get going, uh, uh, hey, Eddie, uh, before we get going, uh, I'll do a couple imports. So we, we've got uh, you know the normal loading of the IBM Q provider, loading our credentials. I'm getting I'm using a custom provider uh, that, that's internal to IBM right now uh, with the Bilbergen device. Uh, and, and for the most part, I'm just using this to get access to some properties of some real hardware. So the configuration, the properties, and the defaults. Uh, and so today I'm going to be focused on a bell circuit. So, so here's a bell circuit in Qiskit. It's pretty simple. We just have two qubits. We apply a, a Hadamard, a controlled knot operation, uh, and, uh, and we're going to, we draw it out and we see there's our, our bell circuit. And so, uh, Douglas, the question about what does the Qiskit uh, pulse schedule do? Uh, the answer is it really depends on the Hamiltonian that the hardware imp implements. Uh, and so that's going, the pulse schedule tied with the Hamiltonian, and we'll talk about a, a bit about this later, is going to determine how we affect the hardware. Uh, so this one probably does nothing, but if you have pulse access to a, a device that has more than four or five qubits, you can try it out yourself and report back to me. Uh, and, and yes, I'll, I'll try and get the notebook out after. Uh, 
Uh, I don't think I'll be able to do it today, but uh, I, I have to, you know, get pr approvals and whatnot through IBM to make it open source. But uh, yeah, I'll try and release it after this uh, talk. Okay, so so we had this quantum circuit, and the question is, uh, now we have the circuit. How do we actually make it do something on this device you see here? Uh, so this device you see at the bottom of the fridge, there's a chip. Uh, inside the fridge, there's a bunch of attenuators, uh, quantum limited amplifiers, other uh, different uh, pieces of hardware that then take us out of the fridge to the room temperature control electronics that are actually going to drive stimulus to, to manipulate the qubits. Uh, and so, you know, there's a lot going on. And we've tried to abstract a lot of that into what we call pulse. Uh, so, so a lot of quantum control problems can can be uh, abstracted into uh, a formalism that thinks about the Hamiltonians that are going to, uh, that determine the quantum systems. Uh, and then we, we insert control stimulus terms into these Hamiltonians that we say we control these knobs and these Hamiltonians in, the, in these time dependent stimulus. And if we choose that stimulus just right, we can guide the quantum system to do the operations or the gates that we want it to do. So today I'll speak a bit about how we can actually do that and, and what the requirements are to do this. So in Qiskit, uh, you know, first of all, we can't actually just run our original Bell uh, circuit with the Hadamard on, on the chip because the, Had the Hadamard gate isn't native to our, our gate set, which for this device is uh, the identity gate U1, U2, U3, and the CNOT gate. Uh, so, so we run it through the Qiskit transpiler and it's going to replace that Hadamard operation with a, a U2 with angles of zero and pi. Uh, and, and later in this demo, I'm going to show how with Pulse, you can actually define your own basis gate set. And then with that basis gate set, schedule your, your uh, use that with the transpiler in Qiskit uh, using the new equivalence li library in V0.2 uh, to zero uh, and, and use that as you normally would at any other circuit. For any other backend. Uh, another new feature that's coming in Qiskit, so this isn't released yet, but it's in a branch that is linked to in this notebook, uh, is we have the ability to look at scheduled circuits. So we can actually take uh, the gate model now and schedule it in time and see how it's going to, uh, uh, and, it, and schedule it using delay operations uh, according to some scheduling policy. In this case, we use ALAP scheduling or as late as possible scheduling, which tries not to perturb the qubit until uh, until as late as possible so as not to have the effects of noise in the environment uh, ruin the qubit state. Uh, uh, so, so, so the Hamiltonian doesn't just measure energy. It's also going to uh, be a... Uh, it, it's going to inform the trajectory or determine the trajectory of the quantum state uh, following the, the Schrodinger equation, uh, Ish. So uh, if, if you look at the Schrodinger equation, you'll see that uh, the, the key uh, term that, that is in the control, if you set it and you want to look at the evolution of a state, that, that evolution is going to be determined by the, the system's Hamiltonian. Uh, so, so... Uh, we can look at the transpiled uh, circuit now, and, and we can look at the timeline for the circuit and see that it's now been scheduled so that the C naught operation happens after the U2 operation. Uh, uh, and then following that, we do a measurement. But we can also take this one step further and go down to the level of uh, microwave pulses. And so this is what I want to spend most of my time talking about today. And in Qiskit, we also provide the scheduling interface, which allows you to take your quantum circuit, which has been uh, transpiled for the native gate set for the device. And then we can uh, replace, in a sense, all of the gates with their pulse equivalents. And now we get the equivalent microwave program that when we take these pulses and, and other instructions that play on uh, Qiskit pulse channels and send them to the back end, the back end is going to uh, make sure that in time, with hard real-time deadlines, uh, play out these instructions synch uh, synchronously 
uh, so that we can, in a sense, orchestrate the evolution of our quantum system. And what's really critical is that we get these pulses that you see in the, in the plot below just right, because otherwise uh, we won't do the desired evolution for the system. Uh, but the, the caveat to this is that the pulse model is much harder to understand. I, I know many of us uh, think, myself included, that the gate model is difficult, where we have uh, unitary, evolution, uh, uh, unitary gates and projective measurements but underneath all this, uh, the physics of the, the actual hardware become much more relevant at the pulse model. Uh, and so the way we try and handle this complexity is we view the gates as the, the instructions at the user level. And then to implement these gates in the hardware, they're implemented as, in a, in a sense, a microcode. So each Kiskit gate, uh, like your, your C0 or your U3, is then defined in terms of micro instructions. These are the pulse instructions. And we store that as a calibration for that gate. And that calibration uh, might change quite frequently, say on the order of, uh, typically on the order of every day. And so uh, we tend to handle that complexity for you when we present uh, a device in Kiskit uh, through the IBM Q provider. But with pulse level control, you can actually dive deep into that, into that area and explore a lot of the physics and also a lot of techniques to uh, improve both your your qubits, your quantum circuits, as well as characterize the devices. Uh, and so how do we get these in Kiskit? Well, Pulse backends provide them via a registry, which is known as the instruction schedule map. So every backend on the, every Pulse backend in the defaults uh, object provides an instruction schedule map. And these, uh, and this contains all of the, the gates that have been calibrated for, for this given device. And these are updated as the device gets updated. So here I've pulled out the, the CNOT operation. And we see that this is composed of, of several pulses. We have uh, pulses on the uh, zero, uh, the first qubits drive channels. We have pulses on the, the second qubits drive channels. And we also have uh, pulses on what we call a control channel here. And this is a, a channel designed to uh, perform an interaction between qubit zero and one. And it does this by pulsing on qubit zero at the frequency of qubit one. Uh, and we see here that simultaneous to this uh, control channel pulse, there are also pulses on, uh, on the drive channel of qubit one. And this is to compensate for errors due to crosstalk uh, between qubits in the actual hardware. So it can get quite sophisticated trying to tune up these pulses just right. And behind the scenes, we run uh, you know, state-of-the-art calibration routines daily to make sure we get pulses just right. And it's still an active area of research of how to design these pulses uh, and to improve the fidelity uh, and the performance of our uh, quantum computers at IBM. Oops. So let's take a look at, at what the actual hardware, uh, like what the actual execution model is in in Kiskit. So so what we do, what we have, or what you have as a user is you have a computer that sends a program to the control electronics on the back end. So we send down a program, and and it's going to have some pulses that are going to go into the control electronics, which are then going to send out stimulus uh, microwave pulses into the fridge that are going to interact with the qubits, either to do unitary gates or projective measurements. And then the, the tone, if it's a measurement, is going to travel out of the fridge, and it's going to go back into the control electronics, uh, and we're going to uh, view uh, the, the results uh, that the control electronics uh, send back to you as the user through IQX. Uh, so uh, Manuel Morgado asks, uh, hi, the drift and the control sequence are given by different channels of the AWG or different frequencies. Uh, so yes, you're right. There are, uh, there's a drift Hamiltonian and there's a control Hamiltonian. And the drift Hamiltonian, in a sense, is, uh, always, is always operating. Uh, so, so it's always going to be causing evolution of the system. We tend to look at it the system in a in a rotating frame where it's stationary, uh, but this is going to modify our, 
our, our control Hamiltonian. And the, the channels correspond to terms in our control Hamiltonian. Uh, so, so basically we can separate our Hamiltonian into ones without channels. These are just the drift and the system is always experiencing this drift. And then uh, the control Hamiltonian is where we couple, is what allows us to understand, it allows us to understand what our stimulus channels are doing uh, to relate that to the system. Uh, and Ish, uh, uh, Ish asks, asks uh, in the CNOT gate, why do we drive a qubit zero at the frequency of qubit one? So I'll come back to that later in the uh, presentation. And Eddie's asking, what is the y-axis of the pulse uh, figure? And so in this case, uh, the y-axis is amplitude, and this is normalized amplitude. Uh, so it's between, it has a max norm of one. Uh, and behind the scenes, uh, there will be some uh, constant pro proportionality in the Hamiltonian that's going to relate this to the action on the device that a given pulse will, will induce. Uh, so, so what is the Qiskit pulse programming model? So we, we model pulses uh, as arrays of complex values or samples. Uh, sorry, the, the formatting has gotten a bit messed up. Uh, each sample is applied or played for a time interval of DT. And so typically DT is on the order of uh, 0.22 nanoseconds in our, in our hardware right now. And the pulse specifies an envelope that is mixed up with the carrier uh, signal, which is defined by a tuple, uh, which is the uh, frequency of that, that carrier signal and the uh, phase of that carrier signal. So we see in this diagram below that we have several different types of channels. So the ones with blue arrows represent uh, pulse channels. And we send in the uh, stimulus tone. It's going to get mixed up with a carrier signal at a given frequency. Uh, and then this is going to get sent into the device to interact with the hardware. And the measurement tone, uh, in particular, measurement, uh, measurement is done with uh, pulse channels as well as a stimulus pulse that, that, that will have its shape shifted depending on the, the state of the qubit. And, and that will travel out of the fridge and be discriminated by the hardware itself. And that result will get sent back to you in Kiskip. So what does this hardware look like behind the scenes? Well, typically we have a, a few core components. We have uh, sine wave generators, which are going to generate this, this carrier signal. Uh, so these are, are produce, producing nice, clean, crisp, crisp carrier tones. And then we have arbitrary waveform generators, which are going to allow you to specify your envelope of a pulse and play it out in time, uh, just like uh, exactly with hard real-time deadlines. And so this is how we enable, uh, and these AWGs are going to be synchronized together so that when one plays out something at t, tone, time ti, we know that the other AWG that corresponds to a different qubit is going to play out that sig uh, a different signal, but they have the same notion of time. Ti is the same for both of them, which, uh, which allows us to synchronize the pulses, which is a, a requirement for our quantum control problem. And then we're going to take these two tones uh, the the, uh, the sine, sine tone and the AW, the, AD, the, the carrier tone and the uh, envelope, we're going to mix them together in a mixer and then send this down into the fridge, which of course is going to go through a bunch of other microwave hardware, like amplifiers, splitters, coaxial cables, power supplies, clocks, digitizers, other computers, etc. There's a, a, a ton of heterogeneous hardware that goes into a quantum computer and one very active area of research is miniaturizing all of this, which IBM is, of course, pursuing. Uh, and so Manuel asks, at which sampling speed are, are the pulses? So in our hardware, uh, the, each pulse sample takes 0.22 nanoseconds. Uh, and then we have the requirement that you can only specify pulses in uh, chunks of 16. So you can specify any arbitrary uh, for those 16 samples, they can be any arbitrary sample, but you can't say specify a pulse that is um, uh, that is 15 samples long. It has to be a multiple of 16. And that's just due to how our, our, our hardware works internally. 
So now let's return to the pulse model, but let, let's try and put it in terms of a Hamiltonian uh, that that uh, is going to, let, let's try and put it in terms of a Hamiltonian to see how uh, the drive channels uh, in, in the pulse model map to this Hamiltonian. So in this Hamiltonian, we have a, uh, the qubit has a frequency, so it's a two level system and it has a frequency FQ. Then there's this constant of proportionality I mentioned for the Rabi drive strength, the qubit drive strength. And these are our samples. So our time dependent samples that we choose, this is our envelope. And then we're sending in a carrier signal, which has its own frequency, which is also a knob we control and it has a phase. And this is going to do uh, an X rotation for the qubit. So normally omega is much smaller than FQ. So if we were to send in a, a signal at, at some random frequency, nothing would happen because the, the sigma Z term, the quantizing axis is going to dominate in Hamiltonian. But if we happen to choose uh, the frequency of our drive such that it's the frequency of our qubit, well, now we're on resonance with the qubit. And, and if we do the, the right math, uh, we can show that this is going to allow us to manipulate the state of the qubit with control around the X and the Y axis and with the virtual Z gate, also the Z axis. Uh, so, so now we know our knobs that we control. So we control, uh, uh, we control our, our envelope, our, our drive carrier frequency and the phase of that carrier signal. And we also know that the, the properties of the system that we don't control our drift Hamiltonian which are the frequency of the qubit and the constant of proportionality for our drive tone. And so now we're going to take this uh, envelope that we specify, we're going to mix it up with a uh, carrier signal with a frequency and a phase, and then we get our output tone, and this is what the hardware is actually going to see. So now I'm going to try and do some live coding demos. I hope I can remember what I was supposed to do, but worst case, I have... Uh, uh, the actual uh, code uh, hidden behind the scenes as a backup. So I find that the theory we showed in the last slide, uh, it, it's a bit confusing, uh, especially when we look at the pulse model here, like what actually is going on. So really, it, it's quite simple. So if we define a pulse, so let's, so we above I've defined some properties for our pulse, like a duration, the sigma for the pulse, the amplitude of the pulse and the, the time step in this case, it's 0.1 nanoseconds. And so let, let's define our, our, our time steps. Our pulse is going to have a duration of 100. And now the times are going to be just the time steps uh, by dt. So now we've defined our times. And let's just do a simple uh, uh, Gaussian pulse. So this is just going to be. Uh, our, our envelope is going to have something that looks like uh, so we have our, our times uh, our time steps and then we're going to take away the center so duration divided by two and then we have our sigma I think all of this is squared we might be missing a factor of two. So now we've defined our envelope, uh, and this is the pulse that we're going to send out. Now in Qiskit, we have a pulse library, so you don't have to write all of your pulses by hand. We, we provide some common pulse shapes, and we also pr provide parameterized pulse shapes that are going to be more efficient on the device, and the device is going to return these as well. So you can just see, oh, the device is using a Gaussian. What parameters define that Gaussian? Uh, but now that we've defined our envelope, we need to define our carrier. And what is a carrier? Well, it's really just a uh, uh, it, it's just uh, an oscillating uh, complex exponential. So we have our our time steps. Uh, and we we have a frequency that we've defined and uh, we also have DT, so we need to know what DT is. And did I get this right? Uh, I think I did. Uh, and we also have, 
like I said below uh, earlier, we can we can also control our phase. So by doing that, we can shift the phase of a pulse, uh, and and uh, control the whether we're we're playing a pulse essentially along the x to the y quadrature of our qubit, which I'll I'll show in a second. And you see here that. Uh, Uh, we have our two two uh, carrier signals now, and now in the hardware we're just going to mix these two signals together, and it's pretty simple. Uh, so the output, well, I guess it's already shown below. My bad, uh, but the output is literally just the envelope and the carrier mixed together. Uh, so so the purpose of the carrier. Uh, so Ish asks, uh, sorry, but I missed what the purpose of the carrier pulse is as opposed to the actual pulse. So the AWGs we use, they can only, they, they have a finite uh, sampling rate. So they, they're only able to out output uh, pulses with a given uh, bandwidth. And the qubits, our superconducting qubits have a frequency of around five gigahertz. And the AWGs just aren't capable of emitting a pulse uh, uh, at five gigahertz. So what we have to do in our hardware is we, we specify an envelope and then a carrier signal. And then we use microwave electronics to uh, uh, mix the carrier signal, which is an analog signal, with the, the output digital signal from our, our AWG to form a signal like below, which is a Gaussian pulse that, if you look at it, the Fourier domain is centered at 5 gigahertz. And this is going to be on resonance with the qubit and it's going to allow us to control the qubit state. So now uh, in Kiskit Pulse, we, like I said, we have control over these pulse channels. And we have three types of pulse channels, the drive channel, the measure channel, and the, the control channel. And using these, uh, we're able to control our system. Uh, so it, it's pretty simple to play a pulse. Uh, all we have to do is uh, using the builder interface here. Here we activate building of a schedule. And now we just need to uh, play a pulse, which is going to be a list of complex, uh, complex samples. So in this case, I'll just make it a, a triangle wave. Uh, so we want to go from 0 to 1, uh, 100, and then we're going to play it on D0. And then we want to go in the opposite direction. Uh, where we want to go from 1 to 0. Uh, and we're going to play it on the drive channel again. And we might also want to uh, to use a parametric pulse. Uh, so here we're going to play one on our qubit, uh, on our, our measurement channel, we'll play a Gaussian pulse. So this Gaussian pulse will have uh, a duration of 100 as well an amplitude of 0.5 and a sigma of 20. And then we're going to play it on a different channel. Now we, we draw this pulse and we see that uh, we get what we expected, although maybe we'll just extend the length uh, of our Gaussian pulse so it's symmetrical with the, uh, with the uh, uh, triangle wave we defined above. Uh, and D Silva asks, so ideally we would s simply send a microwave signal at five gigahertz uh, uh, if we had the tech for it. I think uh, that that's pretty close. If we could do that, what we'd like to do is uh, we would send uh, an envelope with a sideband at, at it digitally. So there'd be no need for the carrier signal. And so we could uh, mix together the signals like I did above in this slide here. Uh, entirely at the, in the AWG uh, for, uh, with no need for other hardware, uh, like, like the microwave gen generator. The problem is, is that the, this would be uh, very, very expensive. And one of the efforts in miniaturizing our hardware is, is trying to make things more cost effective so that we can scale to more qubits. Uh, Ish uh, asked, shouldn't the measurement pulse be executed after the triangle pulse? And the answer is absolutely. If I was trying to to show how I would norm, uh, if I was trying to actually do a measurement, it really should. And to to do this, it's pretty simple. 
I can just, there's many ways I can do it with the, with the, uh, the pulse interface. I could just uh, barrier the two channels. So now the, uh, the measurements will happen after. Another alternative that I could have done is I could have used a different form of alignment. So I could have aligned these pulses sequentially uh, instead of uh, align them all to the left. Uh, and this will give me an equivalent result. Uh, and there's many different forms of alignment uh, we have. Like we, we could have also aligned these to the right, uh, and we see that uh, they'll center again because in this case, uh, left alignment and right alignment, which is the default, are uh, equivalent. Uh, so now that we have, we also have other instructions to uh, modify the frequency and phase of these carrier signals uh, available to us in Kiskit Pulse. And uh, and then we also have instructions for doing measurement. And, and like each noticed, uh, the measurement uh, stimulus wasn't proper, properly aligned in the last schedule, but also we were missing an instruction to actually acquire that pulse. So in the circuit model, a measurement is uh, just a projective measurement. Uh, you you, you input a qubit state, it projects that qubit state into one of its outcomes. There's the ground state or the excited state, and then you get a classical bit back. But in pulse, we actually have to control the measurement stimulus tone that's going to weakly measure this qubit over time through a measurement resonator in the uh, superconducting chip. And then we're, this measurement tone is going to come out of the fridge, and then hardware is going to look at this tone and say whether this is a zero or one, because it's going to, uh, its shape is going to change depending on the qubit state. And so to do this, we, we, so we actually have to uh, measure our, our qubit. Uh, so, so here I'm going to call back to the, the schedule we defined in the last slide. But now I have to add a measurement. Uh, and in this case, it's just going to be an acquire instruction on the acquisition channel corresponding to the zeroth qubit. And the, we're going to store it into the zeroth memory slot. Uh, and I made a mistake, missing one positional argument. Oh yes, because an, an acquisition also happens for a period of time. But now we see that we have a problem because our measurements and our, our pulse don't align because we undid what we did in the last slide. So let's uh, go back to this, put a barrier back here. So now this looks like I'd expect, this looks like I'd expect. So now we add this, but we still see that our measurement is going to push all the way to the left-hand side, which is not what we really want. Uh, so, so we want the measurement and the, the acquisition of that measurement. So as that tone plays out, we want to sample that in our hardware and see what's coming back to us. So we want these to be aligned. And I'll do this by just aligning them to the right. And this should make it work. Uh, great. This this is uh, mostly working. I think the pulse is just too short. There we are. Uh, so Ish, if the qubit was in superposition, the the point is is that the qubit is going to collapse into the zero or the one state as we start to measurement measure it. Uh, it's going to choose one of these states. So we really only should have. To, if we take the, the net sum of the values that come out, if we integrate this pulse as it's transformed and comes into the hardware, it, we should really have uh, uh, an output that looks like a zero state and an output that looks like a one state. Uh, but, so, and I forgot to uh, uh, repeat his question. So Ish, Ish asked, suppose the qubit is in a superposition. Would the shape of the pulse be different than uh, what it was if the qubit was 100% zero or one. And so the, the qubit, when we measure it, is going to choose one of these states uh, in a, in a semi-classical approximation. So as we measure it, it's going to say, I'm now in, in the zero of the state, or I'm in the one state, and the output is going to look different. Uh, it's going to only look, there's going to be an output for zero and an output for one. Now it does get a bit more complicated than that, uh, is the measurement is a weak measurement that has some quantum trajectory attached to it. 
but this gets uh, really deep into the weeds of the measurement problem in, in quantum computing uh, and just quantum mechanics in general. And, and this is going to uh, be quite a bit more sophisticated. Uh, but but in our hardware, for the most part, we just say uh, we have we're, we're expecting a pointer state for zero and a pointer state for one. And we're able to draw a line between these two pointer states. And, and if it's on this side of the line, it's a zero. If it's on this side of the line, it's a one. Uh, so Ish asks, I guess my intention was to ask, where does the readout error occur? So the readout error occurs in a lot of places. So to start with, we could just have really poor signal to noise ratio. So, so there could be a lot of noise in our microwave lines that could not be thermalized properly photons uh, sticking around in the measurement resonator. Uh, so, so that's one of the, uh, a big location for, for noise. Our, we could not, we could have insufficient uh, amplification, but we also could have uh, poor measurement pulses. So our measurement tones could not be tuned up to, to be on resonance with the qubit to, to optimize for the SNR. We could also have really poor coupling between the, the uh, measurement resonator in the qubit so that uh, it's it's not the, the pointer states, the separation between them isn't as strong. So there's plenty of places for noise to come up in the measurement problem. Uh, so, so what does what do our quantum chips look like? So so for the most part we use single junction transmons and they have a frequency of around five gigahertz. And they're coupled together with uh, resonators. So these are coplanar waveguides, and they typically have uh, frequencies of around 7 gigahertz. And so you can think of it as if we have two qubits that are coupled together, there's normally a resonator between the two of them that are coupling those two qubits together. And then our qubits also have another measure, uh, resonator coupled to them, which is a measurement resonator. And so this is where we send in our measurement stimulus tone to interact with the qubits weekly through that resonator and project their, uh, their states. And then we can, like I just mentioned, we can look at the, the tone that's reflected from that, that measurement resonator to see what that, that state is. Uh, and so now we know that we have, we have our knobs that uh, we can control, but how do we actually uh, manipulate the state in a way that will allow us to achieve universal control over our qubits? Uh, so, so the first thing we can do, so we're going to get a bit into some math right now. And, and don't worry if you don't follow complete uh, along. Uh, I think the result will be pretty clear afterwards. Uh, so, so what we first do is we take our Hamiltonian we defined in the last slide uh, up here, uh, where there's the uh, qubit uh, drift term, and then there's our, our control term. And what we're going to do is we're going to apply a rotating frame transformation. So we're going to assume that uh, we, go, we go into a frame rotating with our, our carrier signal, uh, so omega d. And, and this, this transformation takes this form. And in this frame, the Hamiltonian, the rotating Hamiltonian, is going to have a, a form that looks like this. So now note that we have uh, the quantizing uh, uh, sigma z term is going to be the difference between the qubit frequency and the drive frequency. So what's very important is that this will disappear if our drive term, if our drive frequency is on resonance with the qubit frequency. And if this disappears, then what we're left with is a term in this rotating frame uh, after doing the rotating wave approximation that just looks like our envelope, which we control with the AWG our constant proportionality, which is a fixed property of the system. Uh, and then two terms here are our, our sigma x terms. So this is how we can do x gates and our sigma y term. And the mixture of these two terms is going to be determined by the phase of our carrier signal. So in this form, it's pretty clear that just by choosing the phase of our carrier signal appropriately, we can actually uh, get x, y control over our qubits. And so this is how we're going to do, uh, this is how we're going to control our qubits uh, by sending in our, our, our envelopes, uh, which are defined by this, uh, at the, with omega Q uh, equal to omega D.
Uh, so this is more of the same here, uh, but uh, if we if we ignore the specifics of the Schrodinger equation here, uh, what we what our unitary evolution will be is if we choose some time that we're going to apply our pulse at and some fixed amplitude. So assuming we use a square pulse, the evolution of our qubit is going to be defined by this uh, this unitary uh, operation here. And if we choose uh, if we choose phi equal to zero, then we see that we get an Rx of theta gate. And if we choose phi equal to pi by two, we see that we get an Ry of theta gate. And so just just with uh, control over the frequency phase of our carrier signal and and the time of our pulse and the amplitude of our pulse, we can, in a sense, get universal control. But we can even do one better, uh, and, and I'll show you that with the virtual Z gate. So, so now we're going to tune up a gate set for uh, a two-qubit system. Uh, so like I mentioned before, our gates are stored in the instruction schedule map. But this time we're going to start with an empty one, and then we're going to populate it ourselves in Qiskit. So I'm going to define a helper function here, and you can. This is just a handy little decorator I wrote up for for this notebook, and all it allows us to do is we can decorate a function uh, that uh, produces uh, 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 we can. Uh, we can decorate a, a function that's going to produce a, a, a pulse schedule. And this decorated function is going to have the pulse builder interface activate it for it. So we don't have to activate it within that function. Uh, so it's just a handy little help, helper function. And uh, to start with, I showed how we can do the uh, sigma uh, x and y operations, but we can actually, in a sense, Get the vert, uh, get the R Z of uh, phi gate for free in our hardware, because if you saw before, if if we increment the phase uh, of our pi by two, it can take a sigma y, uh, in a, a sigma y operation into a sigma uh, sigma x operation into a sigma y operation, and so we can in a sense turn a R X of theta into a, an a R Y of theta. Uh, and this is really akin to doing a, a Z gate, so rotating our, our system around the Z axis. And it's really simple. Uh, all we have to do is, is just uh, add a phase shift to compensate uh, all of the future pulses that will follow uh, this gate. So our, our Z of theta gate is just going to shift the phase of, all f of the carrier signal for all future pulses by the, the amount uh, of theta to compensate for this uh, shift here. So here you see us define a, uh, this, is, this is how we can define a, uh, an RZ gate for our, our zeroth qubit. So this is just a function. It takes one parameter theta, and then we're going to uh, build a pulse schedule for this, uh, this uh, parameter theta, uh, which is just going to have a shift phase instruction. And then we also need to track the frame for our, our uh, control channels that do this uh, cross resonance gate, which I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, so, so that they all share the same fra frame. So we also introduce uh, a frame for these control, uh, a frame uh, shift for these control channels. So this is how we can do it without that, that helper function I defined on the last slide. Uh, and then we have to add this to the instruction map. Uh, but alternatively, we can uh, use this helper function I defined on the last slide. So we just say this is going to be in our Z gate on qubit one for this backend, and we provide the instruction map here. And now we don't have to return it, and it's automatically added to the instruction map. And then we can see what this looks like. So this is, uh, uh, we can then request from the instruction schedule map to get the the pulse schedule for this uh, circuit gate. Uh, so Nile says that it should be uh, a over t rather than a t in the exponent in the right hand side. Uh, so I'm just going to return and look at this. Uh, so theta equals. Uh, a over t. 
Mm. Yeah, you, you might be right. Uh, uh, well, we'll move on for now. I think it's a typo. Uh, so, so now that we've done our, uh, so now that we've defined our, our, our Z gate for the, our basis gate set, we can now move on to uh, rounding out our, our set of control gates for SU2. Uh, so uh, in this paper for the virtual Z gate, uh, there's uh, another identity which shows how we can take a single calibration for a gate. So if we can calibrate a really good uh, uh, pi by two gate around the uh, X axis, then using these virtual Z gates, which we can get for free by tracking the phase in our hardware for our carrier signal, we can do any gate in SU2. Uh, so all we need to do is, is to get this pi by two gate. So how do we do this? Well, now we're going to actually have to run some experiments. Uh, so today I'm going to run our experiments on the pulse simulator rather than a real device just for latency purposes. So I can request from the, the back end that I set up earlier, uh, IBM Cube Obligan, I can request the Hamiltonian from this back end. And then using this Hamiltonian, I can create a pulse simulator model, which is going to uh, simulate this Hamiltonian. Uh, th that's going to be a model for this Hamiltonian that the simulator will understand. And then we, I'm going to pare it down uh, to just the first two qubits. Because if, if we tried to simulate the whole 20 qubit system at the pulse level, uh, it, it would just blow up because it's an exponential problem. So we're only going to focus on the first two qubits. Uh, and once we've done this, we can go ahead and uh, write another quick utility function for calling this pulse simulator and returning a result. Uh, and given this, now we can move into to running our Robbie experiment. So a Rabi experiment is pretty trying to find the, the amplitude of the pulse that will allow us to rotate it from the ground state to the excited state. And as we saw in this slide above, what we're really after is we're after the pi by two pulse, so half this amplitude. And so all we need to do is run a series of, uh, of experiments uh, where we, uh, we, we sweep the amplitude of the pulse that we play out to the to the qubit and then look at as it oscillates from the the zero to the ground uh the ground state to the excited state so ish is asking is the back end a device or some mock device so in this case it's just a it's a simulator so uh it's using the hamiltonian from a real device but it's uh it's just being simulated right now uh so to start with uh, I was going to do this for you, but it seems like the solution's been given away. So all we need to do is we, we've defined some parameters for our pulse above, the duration of our pulse, uh, what the sigma should look like. We're going to use a Gaussian pulse here. The maximum amplitude for our sweep and how many points we want to take. And now what we're going to do is we're going to create 50 different experiments. Uh, so each experiment is going to have a unique uh, Gaussian pulse uh, with its own amplitude. Uh, and then we're going to play out this pulse. Uh, and since we want to calibrate both qubits 0 and 1, we're going to play out this pulse for both qubits. And then we're going to put down a barrier before we measure our qubits. And then we're just going to create a list of these programs to run. And here's one example program. So you see our, our Rabi pulses followed by our much longer measurement pulses. Uh, and so we can run this on the simulator and get a result back. And what we're going to see is that there's going to be uh, some oscillation. And it's not going to be perfect because we're simulating a three-level system here. And we're driving quite strong. And there's also, uh, in this simulation, there's pretty strong uh, coupling between the qubits as well. So it's not quite the exact Hamiltonian of the device. Uh, and so what we're going to see is that, so we see this oscillation and we can fit this oscillation, uh, fit this data to extract the period of this uh, oscillation 
as a function of the drive amplitude. So this relationship here is what we're after. And we see that uh, it has a period of around uh, 0.15. So if we set the amplitude of our pulse to 0.15, it's going to flip uh, the qubit from the ground state to the excited state. And then what we're after for our pi by two pulse is right here. And so this has an amplitude of uh, 0 0.075 approximately for the zeroth qubit and 0 0.066 uh, uh, for the, uh, the first qubit. Uh, and so now we store, we also create some pulses uh, to store these, these amplitudes. Uh, so you see here that the X90, uh, the uh, X90 pulses are, uh, and the X180 pulses. And so now we can take these, uh, these pulses, we just calibrate, calibrate it and define our, our next gate for our basis gate set the Rx of theta gate. And so recall the identity uh, we showed earlier. Well, now we're going to implement this identity using the Rz gate we already defined earlier. So, so for each qubit, we're, I, I just wrote a little helper function here that can do it for any qubit given uh, the X90 pulse. Uh, and so we tag this function with Rx, it's on the, this qubit. For this backend, this instruction map, and basically we, we're going to do a, a minus pi by two around Z. Then we're going to play our X90 pulse. Then we're going to do uh, another rotation around Z by uh, pi minus theta. Then our X90 pulse again. And then finally, we're going to do our, our final rotation about, around minus uh, pi by two. And so calling this, this helper function above is going to define our two gates. And we can uh, examine one of the gates that we just defined in the instruction map. We can pull it out here. Here's one for uh, pi by four. Uh, and if we look at the label, uh, 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 if we look at the uh, table, we can show the angle of that rotation, which should be uh, uh, which should be uh, roughly pi by four. Uh, so, so we can also, just for convenience, since it's easy to do, I, I add our X gate to the basis gate set. Since we already calibrated our 180 pulse, the X gate's really useful for calibrating our measurements. So since this is, allows us to uh, measure our pointer state, so we, we do an experiment where we send in our measurement pulse on the ground state, and then we do uh, the same experiment, but first we prepare the excited state using an X-pulse. So this is re one reason we often calibrate this X-pulse and, and use it. Uh, but now we get on to the, uh, the, the tricky bits. If this wasn't tricky already, now, now we're really getting down into the weeds of quantum control. Uh, because at IBM, we use, for two qubit gates, we use what's known as the cross resonance gate. Uh, so the cross resonance resonance gate uh, is is implemented using two taking two qubits that are coupled together with a resonator. So what this resonator resonator is going to do is it's going to slightly hybridize the energy levels of the qubits. So it's going to cause the the one zero and the zero one states uh, to respectively uh, contain a little bit of their opposite pair, so zero, one, or, or one, zero. And what this is going to do is that it, the math works out that if you send in a pulse onto your, your control qubit, so if you're doing a CNOT gate, what you would say uh, as the, the control in your CNOT gate, if you send in a pulse on that at the frequency of the uh, target qubit, what, what's going to happen is there's going to be a Hamiltonian in real devices that has this form. And the term we're after here is this evolution, this unitary evolution under this Hamiltonian and this Zx term. And so what the Zx term is going to do is it's going to cause your, your target qubit to rotate around the x-axis with its direction proportional to the state of the control qubit. And if we, if we take this term and we find the the pi pulse essentially for this term so it's going to rotate us all the way around from zero to one 
in conjunction with some single qubit rotations, we can create a CNOT gate. Uh, so it's, it's actually a very similar experiment uh, to, to calibrate this cross resonance gate. Although in practice and real hardware, uh, it, it is much more difficult to, uh, to compensate for all the terms that exist in the real qubits when you're implementing this gate. And if you want more information about this, you can look up the Kiskit pulse paper, which is now in the archive, or uh, some of the other cross resonance papers by the IBM quantum group. So similarly for this experiment, we're going to define some pulse parameters. Uh, so so we're, our, the maximum amplitude for our cross resonance pulse, the number of cross resonance experiments, uh, and then also the, uh, how long we want these pulses to be. And in this case, we're going to use a Gaussian square pulse. Uh, so, okay, this time we need to actually implement this ourselves. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to implement our our long Gaussian square pulse. So, so basically that's all it, but all we need to do, but we need to apply it to the control channel for qubit, uh, between qubit zero and one. And in this case, this function takes a control, it takes a target, and it takes a flip drive command, which is, uh, is not, we're not going to use. So to define this pulse, uh, it's going to be a, a Gaussian square pulse. So uh, CR pulse is going to be equal to pulse dot Gaussian square. And the amplitude is going to be the CR, I think we defined it earlier. CR drive, oh no, it's not showing up. Okay, let me cycle back to this slide. So it's uh, CR drive samples is what we want to do. CR drive samples, we want the CR drive uh, and we define our amp. We're, we're iterating over our amplitude. Then we have our sigma. And then there's going to be a width for the, get the square component of this pulse. Uh, that's not showing up either. So it's CR underscore square width. And then we need to play this pulse. Uh, and so this is just going to be, uh, we're going to play our pulse. And this time we're going to use the control channel uh, between qubits uh, zero and one. And so we, uh, the, the builder interface makes this really easy to get. So we can just request this like so. And then of course we have to measure our qubits so let's lay down a barrier between qubit zero and one, and then let's measure our, our qubits uh, uh, zero. I think we can just use dot measure all. Let's see if this works. Uh, uh, it didn't like that, did it? Uh, hmm. Pulse. Control channels. And, and, oh, because this can actually, there can be multiple channels between uh, two qubits. So this actually returns a list of channels. But for our device, there will only be uh, one such channel. Let's try this. Uh, And it seems like there's just, uh, it's just a problem. This expects uh, a list of args. And there we go. So this is our cross resonance experiment. And we can go ahead and run this. Uh, and I'm just not going to right now because it'll take uh, 15 or 20 seconds. And what we're going to get out is we're going to see an oscillation of our target qubit proportional to our control qubit. No, so, sorry. That, that was a poor way of saying it. We're going to see, uh, we're going to see the oscillation of our target qubit while our control qubit stays in its ground state. And this is because if we return back to this slide, uh, the ZX operation 
uh, well, the Z term, if our qubit's in the ground state, the Z term is, in a sense, not going to do anything because it, the, this, this phase accumulation isn't going to matter. Uh, and so in the same way that we did for the Rabi experiments, we can extract this amplitude for our, our pi pulse and our pi by 2 pulse. Uh, and once we've uh, done that, we can go ahead and think about how to construct our uh, this, this is a very naive way of doing it with the cross resonance gate. But if we have this, this Z term, which is going to apply to our first qubit, we can, uh, what we need to do is if we, if we do a pi by two uh, gate on the, uh, between qubit zero and one, we need to undo this Z evolution, which we don't have in our, in our C naught gate. So we undo this with a, a pi by two gate. And then similarly, uh, we, we want our rotation not to be, uh, the, the naive cross resonance gate is going to do a plus pi by two if the qubit's in the uh, ground state or a negative pi by two if the qubit's in the excited state. And what we really want to do is have nothing happen to our qubit if it's in the, the ground state and, and do a full pi rotation if it's in the ground state. So we can do this with a local rotation. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, in reality, there's much more going on in the cross resonance gate. The physics are quite complicated. So normally we actually have to include uh, a, an echoing sequence and other crosstalk uh, compensation uh, sequences in these gates. And so uh, using this definition of the gate above in the circuit model, we can build up our calibrated basis gate for the, the C naught gate. Uh, so here we see our, our cross resonance, our, our, sorry, our, our Z rotation, our RX rotation, our control, uh, sorry, then we barrier before applying our cross resonance gate. And what we get out is something that looks like this. So this is our very naive C0 gate that we've calibrated. Uh, and finally, to round it out our set of instructions, we need to add the measurement and, and Calibrating the measurement is out of scope for, for this tutorial. Uh, one reason is that the simulator can't even handle the measurement process because this is a stochastic partial differential equation. Uh, so I'm just going to take the measurement pulse from the, the uh, back end that's already defined. Uh, okay, and just to, to take a step back and answer some questions before we go any further now that we've defined all of our basis gates. Uh, uh, D Silva asks, as a follow-up from the origin of uh, readout errors, where did the C naught errors come from? Uh, now, this is also still a very active area of research, but the C naught errors, many of them come from the the Hamiltonian not just being as simple as the ZX interaction. Uh, so, if we return to this slide, we'll see that there's a ZX interaction, but there's also IX and ZI terms. Uh, that are going to cause unwanted rotations to our state. But there are also a plethora of other terms uh, that, that are occurring uh, when uh, other higher order terms that occur during this gate. Since this gate is, it's in a sense, we, we have two qubits, but we're ignoring, we're tracing over the, the resonator that couples these two qubits together. And this is, a, the resonator, of course, is a quantum system that has uh, its own, uh, you know, set of energy levels, and these will play a role in, in higher order terms, in interaction terms in the Hamiltonian. So there's a series of papers uh, by the IBM quantum team on uh, examining uh, what these uh, what these terms look like and where these error sources come from. And I'd suggest looking at, there's a paper by, uh, an experimental paper on calibrating these uh, gates from Sarah Sheldon, and there's also a really good theory paper and several follow-up ones by Easwar Magazine that I would recommend, rep, rec, recommend looking at to understand the theory and the error sources of the cross resonance gate. Uh, and, and I can post these in the the, uh, the channel after after I'm done my my presentation. So so now we've defined our basis gate set, and here we see uh, it's a much different basis gate set than we had for our. Uh, our other uh, qubits, uh, sorry, sorry, not our other qubits, our, our back end. 
So if we look at the, the basis gates for the back end, what we're going to see is something different. Uh, so, so in the back end, it defines in terms of U1, U2, U3, C0, and delay. Here we've included uh, the, uh, here our basis gate is in terms of RZ, RX, CX, and X. So we have a different set of basis gates, but Kiskit can now handle this for us without a problem. So let's return to our, our bell state. And, and now that we've defined this, this uh, we've already defined our bell state, uh, but now we have a different set of basis gates and we have all of these basis gates in our instruction map. And so we can go ahead and we can just transpile uh, this uh, circuit now to this bell circuit to our native gate set. Uh, and you see here, we pass our basis gates uh, to the, the transpiler. And this is a new feature as of Qiskit v.20. Uh, so now Qiskit has an equivalence library. So it's automatically able to understand new basis gate sets as long as it can find a path between them. And one thing you'll notice is that there's still work to be done with this new basis gate set. Uh, I, the pass manager probably needs to be optimized uh, because you see here that we have a series of RZ, RX, uh, RZ and RX gates that probably be compressed together into a single qubit unitary. Uh, 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 possibly. They, they should be able to, but I haven't actually thought through this entirely. Uh, so, so maybe there's work to be done there. Uh, and then we can take this uh, instruction schedule map we defined and we can uh, schedule our circuit and it's going to implement uh, the, the bell circuit for us using our calibrated circuits. And so just like that, this is how essentially we bootstrap internally a quantum device into a quantum computer. So we take a raw device where we know nothing. It, it, we made some assumptions in these calibrations like knowing the qubit's frequencies but we can also find these via experiments and similarly for the measurement pulse. And you can take just a raw quantum system where you have almost no understanding of what, what's implemented there other than what you tried to engineer in the fab and, and tune it up into a quantum computer by micro coding these basis gates for your quantum system. Uh, so yeah, so in conclusion, uh, Gates and measurements are implemented with pulses in, in our hardware, but not just our hardware, and, and many different types of hardware can be put into this formalism. Like ion traps follow this formal, formalism, MV center, centers, NMR, even optics can be placed in this formalism if, if you do, depending on the different types of systems, neutral atoms, uh, silicon, uh, phosphorus systems, uh, quantum dots, etc. Many of these systems follow this pulse model. And so what we've tried to do is abstract away the core bits of this pulse model so that we're hardware agnostic and we can, we can start to write a, uh, a library of calibrations uh, for, uh, for uh, quantum devices that will uh, uh, allow us to uh, uh, both characterize and tune up quantum devices. And, and so many of these live in, in Kiskid Ignis. Uh, so there are... Uh, uh, a bunch of uh, calibration routines for our devices there. Uh, but there's also the start of an experimental framework being added to Kiskit Ignis. Uh, and, and similarly, once we've we've tuned up our gate set, I, we could have run randomized benchmarking on our gate set uh, above at the circuit level and characterize the quality of our gates. Uh, and I'm not going to today just because there's a, there's a lack of time. Uh, and, and so, you know, as a question, where would I take this next? Well, in this example, I use drag pulses. And, uh, well, in this, in this example, I use Gaussian pulses. In reality, I might use drag pulses to compensate for unwanted transitions to the higher energy levels in the, in, in the qubits. I might actually run our new gate set on the actual back end and see that it didn't perform very well because there's a discrepancy between the Hamiltonian model we use to calibrate it and the, the, the physical model of the back end. There's much more going on there. The hardware comes into play, nonlinearities in the hardware. The Hamiltonian is changing all the time as the system drifts. And it's also just hard to measure that Hamiltonian. So similarly, we could have actually measured the Hamiltonian for the system using pulse. 
whereas today we just we just took a pre-calibrated version. We can investigate new calibration techniques for our pulses. Uh, we could characterize our gate set using randomized benchmarking. We could add dynamical decoupling to undo unwanted interactions in, in the environment, and so we can time those pulses just right to to implement these dynamical decoupling techniques. Or we could add uh, new efficient uh, entangling gates to our basis gate set. So instead of just using a single cross resonance gate that has a fixed time, we could actually make it cross resonance of theta gate quite easily. I've already shown you all the tools and just change the duration of the gate such that the we, we linearly change the integrated amplitude under that pulse and that would correspond to theta. And so that's something you could do right away. So these are all, there's, there's kind of, so much to, there's so many opportunities, but it's also much more complicated. And it's also, uh, to be fair, it's much more raw than the circuit model is because we're still in many ways figuring these, uh, the, the abstractions and the, the API and the interfaces out. So any feedback is much appreciated. So with that, that that's the end of my uh, presentation. I wanna thank you for, for tuning in and letting, letting me talk to you uh, about uh, some of the work I've been work uh, that I've been up to for the last year or so, and uh, uh, and hopefully give you an idea of kind of some of the hidden capabilities that exist within Kiskit. Uh, and, and now I'll, I'll go ahead and answer any questions you might have uh, for for, us, for a, a little bit a little bit longer. So Manuel is asking, uh, the transpiler is more dependent on the instruments or the platform, for example, in superconducting and ion qubits. So, so ideally, the transpiler should be agnostic of, of the instruments and the platform, because the transpiler operates at the uh, level of the quantum circuit model or gate model, uh, where all we have are unitary gates and projective measurements. Now, the tricky bit is, is when you try and transpile a, a circuit or compile a circuit to a specific piece of hardware, the transpiler needs to know how to work within that circuit or gate model to take you from a, a, a logical gate set or a virtual gate set to one that can map down to the physical gate set of the hardware. So it needs to know how to translate, for example, our Hadamard gate to uh, one of the native uh, gate sets. So for example, if we return to our original gate, here we see our basis gates that we've defined. And uh, after we run it through the transpiler, it knows how to map it to the, uh, it knows how to map the Hadamard gate to our basis gate set. But the C0 gate uh, was already part of our basis gate set since we calibrated that explicitly. Now in the uh, ion trap case, the core gate that they use is the Wolmer Sorensen gate. And that's uh, quite a bit different, but it does exist in Qiskit, and we do support the equivalence library to go from that from any gate in Qiskit to the Molmer Sorensen gate. So in that sense, Q, uh, Qiskit is agnostic to that, provided the basis gate set is defined for the back end. Uh, uh, let's see some other questions. Uh, it seems the Qiskit pulse simulator does not, sorry, Ish asks, it seems the Qiskit pulse simulator does not have a way to implement time dependent noise. In the Slack chat, you suggested uh, reading Q-tip papers. Uh, could you reference uh, which ones would be helpful? Uh, so yeah, certainly I can uh, send those to you uh, either in this YouTube's uh, chat or I can send you one uh, personally on Slack. Uh, there is definitely plans to add uh, uh, dissipators to the pulse simulator. Uh, there's actually a, a lot of development underway uh, on the pulse simulator happening behind the scenes. Uh, and, and unfortunately, the the user API has, has re remained kind of stagnant in that time period, but we have big plans uh, for that simulator. Because one of the, the powerful things about using a simulator, like you saw in this, uh, in this uh, presentation, is that if you have a good model of your system, uh, you can actually design pulses with that. And there are uh, techniques like like grape or crab uh, uh, and uh, a variety of other uh, optimal control techniques that require a really good simulator. And we want to enable these in Qiskit. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, 
what what says don't you need a larger gate set for rb uh so so yeah you typically need your full uh uh su4 uh clifford set but uh the transpiler, since we have a universal gate set here, the transpiler is able to implement all of our Cliffords for us. Uh, and so, so we describe them at the, at the Clifford level, uh, at the level of virtual gates, and the transpiler is going to map these to our basis gate set. Um, so, so we could do RB for for this set of basis gates, uh, since since it's universal for our two qubits. Uh, uh, Neil asks, will, will the transpiler model change from qubit modality to modality then? Uh, if you, if, so, so it shouldn't change from qubit technology to technology. So outside of, uh, uh, outside, of, as long as they remain within the circuit model. So if we, if we have a, a different approach to quantum computing or quantum advantage, such as uh, adiabatic quantum computing, uh, this would not fit well within the transpiler model. But within the circuit model, uh, I think that the transpiler should be agnostic for the most part of technology so long as the right information is provided to it. Uh, uh, Ish asks, what is the drive frequency? I, th I think the qubit frequency is zero to one. Is, I think the qubit frequency is zero to one amplitude. So, so the drive frequency is, is something we control with, with pulse, but typically we'll set it on resonance with the qubit, so that zero to one transition frequency, which will be around five gigahertz. Uh, for, for this qubit, for these qubits, I think it might have been like 4.98 gigahertz and 5.02 gigahertz, but I can't remember. Uh, I mean, we, we can check uh, quickly. Oh, I just deleted it. Uh, Uh, we can't check. This is, uh, I don't want to exit this notebook right now because it might uh, mess up the video streaming, but uh, it, it's roughly around five gigahertz. Uh, manual repeats, if one needs to repeat these sequences like quantum error correcting codes, is it possible to apply optimal control on these pulses? So uh, yeah, it's totally possible to implement optimal control. And it's one thing that I've been working on actually with an intern uh, this summer is adding optimal control to, uh, to uh, Qiskit. And it's actually really simple to do. So basically you can take this instruction schedule map and you can uh, override it. So instead of when you ask it for a gate, so you ask to get the gate, a specific gate, you can just design that gate on the fly instead of using one that you stored there. Uh, and so it's pretty simple to, to extend uh, the pulse model to do optimal control. Uh, of course, you still need a good model for your system, a good Hamiltonian, and you still need a good way of doing uh, the optimal control uh, for, for kind of arbitrary Hamiltonians. And these are all very tricky things to do and get right. But it's been very exciting to see this, this uh, develop. Uh, uh, Nile says, here you may depend on the inharmonicity for higher levels, but that may not be available in all qubits. Yeah, so in this case, uh, I use Gaussian pulses because of the higher energy levels for these qubits and not wanting to excite them. Uh, but the, the point of pulse is that we can use whatever control techniques we want and, and really uh, so, so behind the scenes, we're, we're defining these arbitrary pulses and scheduling them absolutely in time. But at the higher level, we're microcoding gates. So these atomic operations that have a defined unitary meaning. And this, this abstraction, uh, uh, going between these two abstractions, uh, the lower one is dependent on the device. But above that, we're not dependent on a device anymore. So we, we, we kind of, uh, we go from, uh, the gate model is independent of devices, but might depend on the basis gate set. The pulse model, every pulse we define is very much dependent on the device and the specific qubit that we're talking to. Uh, and uh, Nile, you're asking what channel on Slack? Well, uh, we have an open pulse channel on our Kiskit Slack, so feel free to join there and ask questions. And uh, 
myself and the team will respond to questions there. Uh, uh, and what what's asking, but doesn't that change the error per gate or cause problems? And I, I'm not quite sure what this is exactly sure what this is with respect to, but if we if we don't define a unique calibration for each gate, then uh, we're going to have problems. Uh, so it's really important that we tune up the pulses for every single gate we use. Uh, that way, uh, the the we have the best uh, control that we can possibly hope to have because the properties of every single qubit in our systems are different because these are artificial atoms that we're creating. Other systems like say ion traps have have uh, uh, or neutral atoms have a bit uh, easier time with this because every ion from the perspective of the universe is, is the same, right? So so what works for one ion should work for another ion. But of course, there are always differences and nonlinearities in the actual hardware that implements these pulses and, and, and imperfections. So that, that's not always as simple as it seems uh, still. Uh, uh, Narendra is asking any remarks on using shortcuts to adiabaticity to reduce the gate time. Uh, so, I mean, at the end of the day, the, the drag pulse, it's kind of, you know, it's doing this behind the scenes as it's trying to transform the Hamiltonian to make what was uh, diabatic, adiabatic. Uh, but there are many other techniques uh, that exist uh, to, to, try and combat leakage to higher energy levels uh, and, and to try and uh, shrink the duration of gate times. And it, it's a really interesting uh, field of work. And there's a couple of interesting papers, such as the one by Daniel Ager, that have come out uh, in the last uh, you know, last six months or so that, that try and uh, uh, make pulses much shorter by, or make our cross, uh, our cross resonance pulses uh, much shorter by, uh, composing pulses from uh, 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 a linear sum of gates. So it seems like uh, that, that's the end of the questions. So once again, thank you for joining uh, me today uh, and, and letting me talk about Kiska Pulse. I, I think I've, I've said you can find me on our Slack channel or on GitHub. Uh, just, just for reference, we'll go back to the very beginning of the uh, the presentation so you can uh, see that information. So, so this is my info here and, and you know where to find me. So uh, have a great rest of your week. Bye now.